don't know what those white people in this country feel. But I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome back to another episode of Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts Katina and Garen. Today's topic is policing and protests. This is part one of two, so be sure to look out for part two when you finish this, as we have some great interviews in part two. We'll begin this episode with a quick discussion on the history of policing, some examples of current protests, thoughts on Blue Lives Matter, and then we end the episode with Garen giving a message to our Christian listeners. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right, Garen, tell us how policing came about. I know that we didn't start the country with the word police and we didn't just start off, you know, new country and we have a police department. So help us help our listeners. How do we get to the point to where we are today with modern policing? Policing systems formed just over time um, and they kind of formed a little bit differently in the north versus the south. Uh, So in the north, I'll just touch on briefly that... uh, the early corollary of police, that they basically, their purpose was they were hired by, paid by merchants and industry to protect goods and to break strikes. So the purpose of the very early police in the North was, uh, the biggest, the bulk of it was to break up strikes for striking workers. 80% of arrests in some jurisdictions were striking workers. Um, So they would go in, Whenever the workers were striking, refusing to work, demanding better labor, better hours, the police would go in and uh, you know beat them with clubs and arrest them. Um, and they were paid by the industry to do that. So uh, that's not a great start, but um, it does get somewhat better. But um, we'll walk through that later. Um, so in the South, uh, police grew out of slave patrols. So the, the early corollary of police in the South was... Uh, Slave patrols that were basically, uh, sometimes they were paid a little bit, sometimes they were uh, volunteer patrols that would go around to the different plantations and basically make any slave uh, that they found produce proof, uh, like a pass from their master saying that they were allowed to be where they were. Um, And if they weren't where they were allowed to be, then they could beat them, arrest them, even potentially kill them. So uh, I'm just going to read some statutes or uh, talk about some different, um, kind of just like a timeline of slave patrols. Um, In 1686, uh, in South Carolina, there's a statute that anyone could apprehend, chastise, or send home any slave found off of their plantation. A few years later, in 1690, uh, such action was made uh, mandatory. It was everyone's duty to uh, police the slaves, or you could actually be fined 40 shillings. Um, Which that's kind of crazy to think that like in the South, it was actually like illegal not to be part of the system of like enforcing slavery. Um, yeah. And just like, that's really dark. Mm-hmm. And also it's weird that people would use like, I mean, now a lot of times people talk about states' rights or autonomy, like there wasn't freedom <laughs> back then. It was like mandated. Um, but Then in 1705 in Virginia, an act made it uh, legal for any person or persons whatsoever to kill or destroy slave runaways um, without accusation or impeachment of any crime for the same. That's a quote. In 1704 uh, in Carolina, it wasn't North and South Carolina, it was just Carolina, um, the Slave Patrol Act, uh, the captain was to quote, muster all the men under his command and with them ride from plantation to plantation and into any plantation within the limits uh, uh, within the limits or precincts as the general shall think fit and take up all slaves which they shall meet without their master's plantation, which have not a permit or ticket from their masters and the same punish. 
Then in 1837, um, historians uh, David Barlow and Melissa Barlow um, say that by 1837, the Charleston Police Department had 100 officers and the primary function of this organization was slave patrol. These officers regulated the movements of slaves and free black persons, uh, checking documents, enforcing slave codes, guarding against slave revolts, and um, casting runaway slave, or catching runaway slaves. So after the Civil War happened, um, then you didn't have slave patrols anymore because you didn't have slavery, but there was basically just this seamless transition from slave patrols. It was like the same people um, who then formed police departments. And then you had uh, the passage of the Black Codes, which were all these laws that were put in place uh, to basically um, try to maintain white supremacy. So for instance, um, we touched on this a little bit before, that there was like Black Codes, uh, that the vagrancy laws that made it illegal for black people not to have jobs, which in effect forced them to continue working for their former slave masters. Because if you just walked off your job, uh, maybe in hopes of going and finding a better one, then your master could report you and get you arrested. And then if arrested, uh, and we'll talk about this in a future episode, um, you could be leased, if you couldn't pay your fines, you'd be leased out for forced labor because slavery was still legal for um, anyone who was arrested or anyone who had a, in the prison system. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so you had the, it, during Reconstruction, you had the military, state militia, the Ku Klux Klan uh, took over the responsibilities of the, the slave patrols. Um, and over time, they just kind of formed um, what came to resemble more and more of what we think of as modern police departments. But obviously, it went through a lot of time and iter- iterations to get there. Um, in 1866, so right after the Civil War um, in Louisiana, when local black men staged a march to support voting rights, um, it, it was like a voting rights convention, white police and mob members indiscriminately killed black people in the area. And this is a quote. For several hours, the police and mob in mutual and bloody emulation continued the butchery in the hall and on the street until nearly 200 people were killed and wounded. Uh, killed and wounded. And, and this was, that quote's from a congressional committee um, that formed to investigate the massacre. Mm. Um, and continuing the quote, how many were killed will never be known, but we cannot doubt that there were many more uh, than, settled, uh, than set down in the official list of evidence. Uh, all through, and EJI has a report on the Reconstruction era uh, where they document thousands of lynchings and many like mass killings, um, dozens of mass killings of black people who were trying to like vote, trying to um, get organized. And police were oftentimes part of that, uh, that um, especially in the South where the, the, uh, they were part, like that's where in that era most of the black people in America lived. Um, they... Uh, the police would facilitate these mass killings. Um, Then moving into the 19th century, um, you have the Chicago race race riot. Uh, Basically, uh, a black youth was swimming and drifted into uh, a white-only section of beach and was killed and resulted in this riot where where you had... uh, 38 dead killed over the course of 13 days, uh, 537 injured, thousands of black people were left homeless. Um, and the, the police were in that protecting white people from black people and killing black people, but doing nothing to protect black people from the white violence that was just being poured on them. It was like the black communities were the ones being burned and destroyed and the police... Um, you see just this clear pattern of like police over the the early 20th century were there not to protect people, but to protect white people from black people. Um, then in 1920, uh, 1920 was finally the first year in which police prevented more lynchings than they facilitated. Um, the Prior to that, the the police were, you know, and they, they oftentimes participated in lynchings. Part of why you had the Ku Klux Klan wearing white robes, I think we may have touched on this before, part of why they covered their faces is because uh, the federal government would intervene if they knew that state actors were 
uh, facilitating or conducting the, the lynchings. Um, but if you couldn't prove that it was state actors like police and sheriffs that were doing it, then the federal government wouldn't intervene. They would just leave it to the states to police it. Um, so the police would put on the hoods so that um, the federal government would stay out and allow them to, to lynch people. So in 1920, you finally had police preventing more lynchings than they carried out. But part of how the police did that, the way they prevented lynchings was uh, to the, like a massive increase in the use of the death penalty. Uh, basically, they knew that the mobs that would form, that were demanding uh, to lynch a black person, were they knew that those mobs needed to be sated. And so they would basically say like, no, 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 don't lynch him, don't lynch him. We'll make sure he gets swift justice in air quotes, like swift what you want to happen to him. Um, and so they would uh, just do like accelerated trials with public hangings in order to get uh, the lynch mobs not to, to lynch people. And, and even in our current counting of like how many people were lynched, we don't account for that because we don't count that as a lynching. But it was like, effectively a lynching. It was it was a substitute for a lynching where the, the police were like basically cooperating with the people doing mock trials in order to like technically prevent the lynching. Um, in Tulsa, where, where we hit on a few episodes back, um, you have that example where the, and this was not the only time this happened, where the uh, sheriff deputized hundreds of white men and gave them uh, permission essentially to kill black people. Um, the, uh, like if anyone resists you, you have, I mean, there's, uh, here's a quote. Um, somebody said, uh, now you can go out and shoot any N word you see and the law will be behind you. Like that's what the mob leaders were saying. Um, so in that era, kind of, uh, kind of early 1900s, uh, police were oftentimes also deeply entrenched in politics there was like a tit for tat relationship between police and politicians, a lot of corruption where um, the police actually were expected to pay a portion of their salary to the politicians, the local politicians, um, and uh, the, they would help get out the vote. Like police would go get people to vote for the politician who was in charge to like mm. rig elections. Um, police, a lot of times, like in the South, they would. Um, arrest black people who are trying to vote. There are, um, all throughout the South, all throughout the early 1900s, there are entire counties where not a single black person voted, where the population is like majority black. And that's not because none of the black people knew an election was happening. That's because the police were guarding the voting precinct and not letting any of them vote and oftentimes would use violence uh, to prevent them from voting. Um, also during this era, you had... Uh, a lot of forced confessions. Uh, the NDA NAACP in 1933, um, which at that point was like very resource strapped, very limited resources, but they documented 51 cases of forced confessions in the southern states, which is has got to be just a small, small tip of the iceberg of how many were actually happening, yeah. just be, given like the the resources that the NAACP had at that time. Um, and in three-fourths of the cases that they documented, the black defendants alleged that they had been tortured into conf confessing by the police. Um, there was like a code for, um, like code words for uh, what police called torture. Uh, they called it the third degree. Um, it was just like a shorthand for using torture to force confessions. Um, a commission uh, was formed at one point in the 1930s and found... Um, the 298 victims of torture, um, and that black people were sixfold overrepresented among those who um, were documented to have been tortured by the police to give false confessions. Um, and then, yeah, and then you had yeah the slow shift of uh, from lynchings to the death penalty, increased use of the death penalty. Um, in the state of Kentucky, historian George Wright comes to the conclusion that the number of Executions of black people carried out in the first decades of the 21st century continually rose while the number of lynchings steadily declined. Um, likewise, uh, W.J. Clark uh, shows a clear connection in the 1920s and 30s between the declining lynching violence and the growing number of African-American defendants who were executed by the state authorities. Uh, the available statistical data on the number of executions carried out in the U.S. between the 1930s and 1970s also just shows just this shift. Um, the death penalty 
was used and became into popular use because it was like an alternate to lynchings. Like it's historically rooted in um, the reality of southern lynchings. Um, And you have uh, a Swedish sociologist in 1944 in a publication, The American Dilemma, uh, wrote the, the policeman, he wrote like an outsider looking in on American culture, said, the policeman stands not for the civic order as defined in formal laws and regulations, but also for white supremacy and the whole set of social customs associated with this concept. It is demanded that even minor transgressions of caste etiquette should be punished, and the policeman is delegated to carry out this function. So we don't have time to get... I mean, there's way more that we could go into in all this. Um, there's a, another podcast that you could go to for that, uh, Behind the Police. They, they have like six longer episodes. I mean, I think like one to two hour long episodes each. And they also have like a lot of good sourcing for all of this um, in the podcast notes over there. So check out the Behind the Police podcast and check out, if you have time, some of the uh, the sourcing that they have the um, that kind of has the receipts for all of this. Um, moving forward into the civil rights area, era, um, you had uh, the Montgomery bus boycott and police during that period um, issued, like black people basically in order to boycott the buses formed these like really incredible and elaborate um, systems of ride sharing. Uh, mm-hmm. It was like early Uber um, that, that they had organized in order to like boycott the buses because they were not being treated equally. Right. Um, and police during that era um, ticketed black people. They like pulled over black cars at like a way higher rate um, in retaliation for the bus boycott. Um, MLK himself was arrested for, uh, not just ticketed, arrested for driving five over the speed limit. Um, Brian Stevenson, civil rights a- attorney, was pulled over. I and mean, this was a little bit later in time, but he was pulled over for no stated reason, had a gun pulled on him. Um, and he was strip searched uh, when he was a lawyer entering into a prison to represent a client. Um, just showing like how policing, like this is just like a real reality that policing was used to enforce. And that's not saying every police officer, but policing, uh, like people say nowadays that there are bad apples. Um, there are bad apples now, there were bad apples then, but like the orchard in these days, in this era, the orchard was, the whole system was set up to be racist and protect white supremacy. And you can see that so clearly back then. And it gets like harder to see it now, um, especially because a lot of white people live in just only white neighborhoods. Because like we talked about in the redlining episode last week, a lot of white people don't live in areas where they have to see this. But, um, But the outgrowth of that history is the unjust and imbalanced system that we still have today. Uh, that police were used to maintain a social caste system around race. Um, you had riots as a result of this. Um, there was, in 1967, um, there was a summer called the Long Hot Summer where there was 163 different cities erupted into collective violence over police brutality and indifference to black suffering. Um, there was, out of that riot, there was a, a commission that the government com- uh, formed called the Kerner Commission. It was a nonpartisan commission with both Democrats and Republicans um, that was basically tasked with like trying to find out what the cause of the racial violence was uh, of these riots. And they said, the Kerner, Kerner Commission came out with a report that said, almost invariably, the incident that ignites disorder arises from police action. That's a quote from the Kerner Commission. Then uh, in Newark, New Jersey, you have uh, uh, part of what, what launched this. You had a uh, six-day riot where 34 people died, 23 killed by police. Detroit, Michigan, 43 people died, uh, most of them shot by 1,700 police, National Guard, and uh, military troops that were sent to set down the rebellion. 1968, you have uh, the after the MLK assassination, 100 cities had uprising and yeah, widespread police beatings and shooting of protesters. Um, the NAACP executive director Roy Wilkins published a best-selling report 
that concluded that for many black people, quote, police have come to symbolize white power, white racism, and white repression. A uh, freedom writer, um, uh, Creedell Petway, said, as a quote, there were, uh, there were simulated beatings and acts of violence that police had to go through in their training with questions about how they would react and how they would protect themselves while the brutality was being inflicted. That's one of the big differences between then and now and something I have not heard about being done in today's protests. Uh, back then, police were like, training on how to uh, beat black protesters. And then in modern times, like just to kind of draw that through line to today, it's like you, you got to ask yourself, when did that stop? Like you have slave patrols, then you have like mass killings, and then you have like lynchings and police condone lynchings. And then like at what point did, did the police like stop being racist? Well, and they didn't. Um, I was just reading where um, these investigative journalists came together and um, there's a website that we can point everybody to where they found that a huge percentage of police officers were um, involved in hate group organizations or hate group affiliated type of organizations um, in their social media like mm-hmm. different groups that um, basically promoted racism and bias. And, and I mean, it was just an alarming study. Um, yeah, they found like thousands of accounts. Right? Yeah, and so just reading, I'm, I'm reading from theroot.com um, where they quoted uh, some of the findings. Uh, it says that, the journalist then wrote software that cross-referenced the two separate lists to see if any of the cops on their list also belong to the cyber hate groups. They expected that they would get a few hits. They got more than 14,000. They acknowledged that there are tens of thousands of police officers on Facebook and thousands of Facebook groups with hateful ideologies. So it would have been impossible to uncover all of the cops who were aligned with online racism. Um, but Re- uh, Reveal, that's the name of the organization reveals reporters began a long process of applying for memberships to the private online racism clubs, even even offering their real identities, names, and photos. Once they were admitted, the group confirmed the identity of people who they suspected were current or former law enforcement officers. They ultimately found nearly 400 active users who fit that description. And so some of the examples, extreme examples, Jeffrey Crosby, a guard at one of America's toughest prisons, the Angola prison in Louisiana. Um, He belonged to 56 uh, extremist groups. Um, James J.T. Thompson, a detective at the Harris County Sheriff's Office in Houston, who posted a meme of a black woman shortly after Hurricane Harvey hit the city. His post said, a reporter asked a, black, asked a black woman how many churches had their doors open um, during the storm. She says she didn't know. She eats at Popeye's. Thomas was reportedly fired after Reveal notified Harris County officials. But during his appeal, he asked, if you remove the black woman's picture, what's racist about it? Um, Will Weisenberger, a sheriff's deputy in Madison, Madison County, Mississippi, who belonged to White Lives Matter and was involved in a lawsuit that accused him of systematic racism in his policing. He is also accused of punching an already handcuffed black man in the face and told investigators that he may have used the N-word. Um, I mean, it just goes on, on and on. There's, you know, belonging to Islamophobic uh, groups. Uh, one officer in Chicago, subject to 70 allegations, including criminal misconduct and excessive force. Um, and then, you know, it just goes on and on. I mean, mm. and it says nearly 35%, 349 of the people who were unarmed, talking about the killings of black people. They were unarmed, not attacking, but were still killed by police in two, two, uh, 2018, were black. And so we even look at, like currently in the protest um, and how black citizens are handled 
um, versus white citizens. I mean, you look at Jacob Blake versus Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, Kyle Rittenhouse, 17-year-old white boy, whose mother uh, drove him with um, assault, his assault white weapons in tow to a protest in Kenosha, knowing that he was underage. Um, he's seen with police officers, uh, you know, they're giving him water, they're thanking him for his service. I mean, they're doing all of that. And then he commits to kill uh, two, white, two white people, actually, two, I think, two, uh, he killed uh, two protesters and injured another. Um, and just how, I mean, we can even go to the Denton protests. Um, you guys know when we were interviewing um, Darius Tarver's father and Anthony Gott, both who are Denton protest organizers, um, that we happened to be there a couple of hours before uh, a back the blue rally was happening on the square. And so I didn't find out about this rally until the day before um, we were supposed to be on the square for our interview. We had already scheduled it. But then when I found out, I was like, well, our interview is at 10. You know, the event, their event starts at noon, so we won't clash. Well, of course, we get on the square and, you know, our interview goes long because there's so much information um, and we're just kind of enjoying talking. You know, a lot of people, like, we hadn't seen each other in a while, some of us. And so there was an overlap because they were preparing for the Back the Blue rally. Um, and as we're there, um, people didn't know why we were there. And we're there, and I have on red, white, and blue uh, Kenty cloth, you know, head wrap. is African uh, print head wrap. Um, and people were coming up to me and they're like, oh, you look so cute. And I, it didn't dawn on me that they were thinking, you know, oh, she's so patriotic. And look at this unique way that she's expressing her patriotism, which, you know, I was not. Um, but I had on a, um, a head wrap and a mask. And they were like, oh, you're so cute. And then white people who were, you know, coming and preparing, um, they were saying some of the most racist stuff, even though I'm black. And they thought I was on their side. They just assumed because we were on that uh, on the Denton Square, um, that we were somehow aligned with them. And so there was just racist, racist commentary being made. Um, and I'm like, how bold um, people were. I was th thinking how bold. And I, at that point, I knew why we were there. We were there to interview, and I really didn't want to be involved. I really didn't want to be engaged. So I just code switched and was like, thank you, and kept it moving. A white man came up and was like, can I offer you some propaganda? And I was like, no, thank you. And um, Anthony uh, got, was like, but thanks for telling us what it really is, for acknowledging what it really is. So people start coming, you know, more and more people start coming to the square. And we're talking to Kevin Tarver, who is very passionate about um, his son, who has died uh, from police, police, police brutality. And there are some, a few Black Lives Matter protesters that started to gather um, and I am a Denton uh, protest organizer. And so I recognize them. And again, hadn't seen them in a while. And so we're just catching up. But we're standing like on this corner of the square. And keep in mind that the square is a public space. Um, so even if people are protesting, just like when the Black Lives Matter protesters, when we were on the square, there were many white supremacists who would come and stand shoulder to shoulder with us. And with I, guns. Huh? With guns. With guns. And we would just ignore them. We would just ignore them. We didn't engage. But we're there, and um, more and more protesters start, uh, or more and more back the blue rally people started showing up. They were circling the square, screaming, um, you know, and, and, and let's just be honest, this area, this, the square was targeted because they're pissed that this monument came down. That's, and they were screaming and yelling and it was just nuts. And so then we, uh, I'm talking to some of the Black Lives Matter and I only saw like one Black Lives Matter poster. Like it was very, you know, Black Lives Matter were there, people there were there just peaceful you know, standing on the corner of a public square. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's music playing. And then all of a sudden, this white boy is being choked to death. Like he's being choked. I look up because I'm doing a live video and he is on the ground being choked um, by back the blue uh, people who have assault weapons. And I was just emboldened because 
I, I just couldn't believe that I was seeing what I was seeing by people who were passing out scripture, you know, you know, talking about the Lord, um, asking us to pray, um, wanting to pray with us because, you know, they saw us praying, you know. <clears throat> well, I mean, it was, just, it was a back the blue. I mean, they were right. there to support police that right. were handling things. But then they, a group of them break out choking this young white man. And the officers, the Denton County, because the, the square is uh, like the property of Denton County. So Denton County Sheriff's uh, Department is there. Officers are there. And, you know, they took their time separating, getting that young white man out of harm's way. And then they took him over for a long time and had him kind of detained while the men who choked him, they just went on their merry way. They should have been arrested. They had assault weapons. Then they decided that they were going to close in on the very few number of Black Lives Matter protesters that were there. They literally said, and I quote something like, let's form a barrier and close in on them and push them out. Um, so their desire was to become physical. And at that point, I, you know, started saying, when you guys were on the square and we were here and we were in the midst, y'all were in the midst of us, many of you white supremacists, with your assault weapons, we said nothing to you. You had a right to be here. And we, you know, we ignored you. But the minute you see, like your event hasn't even started and you start choking people and deciding that you're going to circle in on us. And so Anthony is between us, me and several white men, several white men. He is using his body as a barrier between me and several white men who are cussing at me. I don't give a F. Y'all are Marxists. Y'all are communists. Now these are, you know, back the blue, you know, supposedly Christian and they have assault weapons. We have every reason to fear for our lives. The police did not intervene. The Denton County Sheriff's Department did not intervene as a white mob of white men uh, are pushing up against a black and uh, a black um, and Mexican young man who is using his body to keep these white men from me. Um, and then I saw where after all of this happened um, that Sheriff's deputy, a sheriff's deputy fist bumped one of those men. Like, and they winked at each other as I'm going to my car because I'm, I'm like, I need to get out of here. Fist bumped him and they're shaking hands. And so this is the exact same thing that happened in Kenosha. Um, they applauded and there were people with this young man, Kyle, who knew he was underage and he was allowed to be there with assault weapons and then kill people. Jacob Blake <laughs> was shot in the back seven times with babies in the car. He was unarmed. There is a distinct difference. There is implicit bias. There is a criminalization of black people. Um, there is a, you know, there is no way black people could be on the square with open carry without there being some tremendous alarm. Talking about pushing out the yeah. other protesters There's and the police no not intervening. And then a Black Lives Matter chokes one of the back the blue guys. And then no, the police, the, a black, no, back the blue chokes. Yeah. A, yeah. No, but I'm saying reverse it. Like yeah, if, if it was reversed. If it yeah. was reversed and you had a Black Lives Matter, I mean, just imagine that happening. There's no way that the, the police would just stand there and do nothing and then take the black back the blue guy over to the side and question yeah. him and interrogate him while the black lives. Like, that would never happen because it's not... It's not equal. As we're on the square, you know, a few months ago, we're on the square after Judge George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, and again, we're on the square. Um, their sheriff's deputies, sheriff's office, sheriff's department um, officers are inside the square courthouse and they're taking our pictures. So they're marking us. There are protesters who sheriff's department um, officers have gone and parked outside of their homes and made intimidating remarks. This is the same sheriff's department. We talked about um, Lamont Stowers Jones in yes. his case. This is the same sheriff's department that uh, painted over the racist graffiti at that site to cover up 
uh, the fact that Lermont Sarvis Jones was killed through racial violence. Yeah. And the same sheriffs that then, uh, now I think what you're alluding to, that uh, the NAACP representative who is pursuing that case, yeah. they are daily sending patrol cars outside her home to yep. intimidate her. That's who I'm talking about, yeah. And it's just insane how... Um, oh, at the protest, um, at the at the back, the blue rally, um, as the young man Anthony is using his body as a barrier, they're saying to him, "You better. I wish these police. You better be glad these police weren't here right now because I'd give you something. I'd 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 you know kill you. I'd do this. I'd do that." The young lady that we're talking about, who the police are outside of her off her house intimidating her, she was assaulted by one of those um, Back the Blue rally men because they there was there was ongoing protest and counter protest who hit her like with his assault weapon. She's captured things on video where white men would come up behind her while she's filming and say stuff that you would not imagine and she's bold so she captures it. Um, three neo-Nazis have been identified three neo-Nazis who were at Charlottesville when that happened who were at the Back the Blue rally. There were known white supremacists at the Black the Blue rally. There was violence at the Back the Blue. There were Denton County Sheriff's um, officers and Denton PD. Why, why was there a need to bring assault weapons? One, when you're backing the blue and the blue is there, why, why was there a need to bring assault weapons? Why was there a need to attack someone for counter-protesting peacefully? Um, why was there a need to threaten a black woman? Why was there a need for a black um, and Mexican biracial young man to use his body as a barrier? Like, this is not something that black people have imagined. Um, this is a reality. And... Even as we're dealing with the Kyle uh, Rittenhouse situation versus Jacob Blake, um, the political conservative news, they have put a spin on it to say that this young man, Kyle, was defending himself. Well, and that's, that's kind of the crazy thing. The, the crazy thing is not that, that a youth, a 17-year-old, would do something crazy because he's a citizen. Sometimes citizens do crazy things. Right. The crazy thing is that the right wing media has tried to make him not just like defend him but make him a hero. Yep. Like I see stuff on my Facebook wall like calling him like talk, calling him a victim yep. and saying that he neutralized using the a language threat. he neutralized these protesters. And then like you have a uh, right wing like a Fox News host I think that talked about him as, as tweeted that she wanted him to be president. <laughs> um and you know like like n- the 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 crazy thing isn't that a youth would do something crazy. The crazy thing is that white people in our culture are, are empowering are empowering and honoring someone for killing people. Yeah. Like and that even if you think that it's like self-defense, which I'm not granting that it is. Even if you think that it's self-defense, that's so irrational to to honor someone for, for killing. That. Yeah, to to like to to glorify that. Well, and I I think what we're getting at too is like there's a narrative that is pushing on every one of you that's listening to this. There's a culture, there's a way, there's a story that is being told to you. And I think we're just always going to want to challenge you no matter what story is being pushed onto you from our culture is to don't passively accept it. Um actively lean up against it. And it doesn't mean to say that everything that comes out of culture is pure evil and is wrong and is untruthful, but it is to say that most of it is and that like you can't just be swept into that narrative. If you're listening to right-wing news, it's not so much like, hey, don't listen to it, but it's like lean into it and don't accept everything or that is- Lean against it. Or sorry, yeah, lean against it. That's a better word to say. Lean against it and listen to another thing of news. Like you, you have got to- push back and be active in, in your learning of history in general. And I, I think one thing that's important to point out is that this back the blue rally 
was considered a rally, but then all these Black Lives Matter protests are called protests. Right. And I just think like even that is the narrative that you have got to realize and that, I mean, I you know, I don't fall into a political sphere. I am not a Republican. I'm Me not neither. a Democrat. But I think it, you would have gone to that Back the Blue rally and that was that was a Trump rally. So like just facts on the table, no opinion. There was probably 90% of the memorabilia, even that was being sold, was, yep. was Trump. And so to, to even classify it as a rally doesn't make sense that there were like, I mean, there were at least a dozen people with assault rifles strapped to their chest. And even Garen and I talked to, and I want to go into this a little bit, but like bringing it back to police is we, we interviewed a lot of those people and I don't know what we're going to do with the audio to that. So stand by or, or I guess, yeah, just stand by on that. But and we asked the people, we said, do you see a, um, a contrast between people that are saying blue lives matter and people that are saying black lives matter? Like a contradiction. A contra- do they contradict things. each other? And I think what it, I mean, you can listen, and I don't, again, I don't know what we're going to do with the interview, but in, in me just standing there hearing these people, it, it's almost like they are so bought into the just kind of stew that they're in and that yep. culture that they don't even think about an outside opinion, let alone an outside fact. And, and, and what I want you to talk to a little bit, Garen, is just like even there, there are some things that I think even – even if you're like a staunch left liberal Democrat, you know, and then, uh, you know, th- those people would probably say that these people that were at the back of the blue rally are like super right wing conservative. So like opposites. I think there are things that even those two that are very extreme would agree on in policing in general. Mm-hmm. And I'd love for you to tell them because what we kind of said, we're like, hey, we, we kind of alluded to the, do you think there are bad apples? And everyone would say, yes, there are bad apples. But then from there, I think there's an interesting way that you went about the conversation with them to not just end it at, yeah, well, there's bad apples, so it's like you just need to deal with it. Yeah, You know what I mean? So talk to them a little bit about how you shaped that conversation because we didn't, what we were doing was we weren't trying to trap them and like make them look silly or something, but we really wanted to try to like, I mean, I, we would never probably, these people would probably never have a conversation outside with people that are not, just into the same bubble that they live in. So it was kind of interesting to be like an outsider going into their bubble and giving them thoughts. But talk mm-hmm. to the listeners about how they could shape conversations around that and not just end it at, well, you know, we just disagree or, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, we did, yeah, man on the street interviews. So we just kind of went around with a recorder and we were like, would you mind doing an interview? Ask them if there was a contradiction between Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter. Nobody we- denied be- wanting to be interviewed. So yeah, we, yeah. We, everyone, we got- everyone was down to be interviewed, mm-hmm. um, and then kind of, uh, yeah. The 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 route that I mostly took was saying like, um, that most of them would say like, no, there's not really a contradiction. I just think that Black Lives Matter is all like Marxists. To which we would say like, um, what percent of Black Lives Matter protesters do you think actually are Marxists? And they would say like, oh, well, probably hardly any of them. But then it's funny because they're like dismissing the whole movement because of that line. But then when you ask them, then they're like, well, yeah, actually, most of them are not Marxists. Um, but then we were like trying to talk about specific policies that Black Lives Matter is calling for, for change in policing. And the thing that surprised me is everyone we asked supported the policy changes. Yeah. Every so we said, one. do you think there are bad apples in policing? To which they all said yes. Do you think we need uh, policies that can help find and root out and give accountability when there are bad apples? They all said yes. Do you think that um, when police chiefs want to fire a, a police officer who's broken uh, the regulations of, of the, the precinct, do you think that the police chief should have the power to fire them without the unions um, protecting their job even though they broke protocols? And they're like, yeah, I think police chiefs should have the power to fire them. Do you think there should be like... What should the standard be? Like we're getting into qualified immunity. Like, do you think police officers that you should have to that the standard should be that you have to prove that they like intended to kill and murder someone, or do you think they should be held to the same standard as like civilians? And they were like, yeah, no, they should be held to the same standards as civilians. Like, so like they were actually agreeing with yeah. all the things. Once we actually kind of got into the conversation, they they agreed that there should be accountability. I think they don't realize that there's not. Um, a lot of the back the blue people, it's more like I support Trump, I support the police, and they don't think critically about how 
it's actually not loving for the police. You're not actually helping the police be the best they can be if you're not giving accountability. With great power comes great responsibility, great accountability. Can you say that again for the people in the back <laughs> that need to hear what you just said? Yeah. If you're not helping the police be the best that they can be, yeah, that's not loving to them. If you are protecting the police by removing accountability so that they don't actually function well and build social trust, the police would sh- would actually be safer in their job. And in other countries where this is true, the police are safer. Police would be safer in their jobs if there was social trust. And if the police, if black people didn't feel like the police are like trigger happy, I just saw, I mean, like you see stuff like this all the time, like police just will have their hand on their gun if they're going over to a black person. And like if there wasn't in our culture so much anxiety and distrust, police would be safer. Like if you want to support police, if you think blue lives matter, you should desire accountability, fair accountability that creates a system that is just where people don't feel like their lives are one second from ending every time they encounter police and if you de-escalated the situation, everyone would be safer and better off. And other countries have done that. Well, and I'm on the um, ad hoc committee um, for excessive force review with the city of Denton. Um, our police chief, Frank Dixon, I have a lot of respect for. Um, and I started meeting with him before COVID. And just seeing him in the community and at events and chatting with him um, and just wanting to partner with him. Um, in bridging the gap with uh, the community. Um, And I love Chief Dixon and have the most respect for him. And we have this ad hoc committee um, that was created by the mayor, Chris Chris Watts. Um, And we basically have been meeting weekly to go over policy, to go over um, just law. And we have an amazing team of people that... Um, represent various cultures and ethnicities and uh, careers. Some of them are police, um, and many of them are the Denton protest organizers and Denton protest participants like myself. Um, And it's just... It's just amazing. Um, It was something I was going to say about when I was at the protest and... um, Oh... So, you know, it was interesting because when you were talking about how when you you spoke to the uh, rally, the Back the Blue rally people and how they agreed with things that you, as you laid them out and they, you know, everything you suggested, everything you said was reasonable and they agreed with. One of the things that I said um, as I was face to face with uh, these men who were coming towards me, I was like, you know, you guys don't care about police. You're using police as optics because many, and I, listen, I exist in white spaces and I know many stories about white people who have encountered police officers, officers spat in their face, um, cussed them out, I'll have your job, um, and just have been horrible to police officers and even more horrible to black police officers. And these will be the same people who are so such staunch supporters of police officers because what they're supportive of is slave patrols. They're supportive of black people, of black of police officers um, keeping a handle on black people and brown people and other people um, because they don't want to be police because look at what happened on that public square. They broke the law. They broke the law at a back the blue rally. And so my statement is, you don't care about police officers because guess what? The suicide rate in that industry is huge as they see, as they're pulling dead babies out of cars, as they're coming in and people's brains are blown out. Like the suicide rate, and and my husband has worked um, in law enforcement for 16 plus years. He's a police officer. He is a a state-licensed police officer. Um, The trauma that they endure, the work hours, the low pay, um, the benefits 
it varies from agency to agency, but many police officers are not, they're hardly making ends meet. They're having to work other jobs. And so my thing is, if you cared about police officers, you'd want to pay more taxes so that they could get paid well. You would be advocating with city officials and state officials and county officials for them to be paid better. You wouldn't just be having a back the blue rally where you break the law. Like you would advocate for mental health care um, for, you know, support for police officers. Because those are the things that, you know, you, you would be advocating for retirement benefits, excellent retirement benefits. Instead of, you know, a poli- police officer gets shot and you throw flags on your car and you drive around and you wear them on your T-shirt while, you, you know, many of you break the law, you know, or don't think that the law, like that you're above the law. You just want them to police other people. Um, there's so many things that you could be doing for police officers because they suffer in so many ways. And what Black Lives Matter, what we are advocating for when we talk about defunding the police, it's reallocating excessive funds to support the police. So Chief Dixon, he, you know, he's heard us and listened to us. We talked about mental health support because in the case of Darius Tarver, Darius Tarver was in a um, state of mental duress. Like he had had some trauma and um, he was having a mental episode and he was killed. And so Chief Dixon has listened to us, heard us, and he's basically um, set out like several positions. He's allocated several positions for mental health police officers as well as mental health workers to ride along with officers so that if there's a case of mental duress, that they their expertise can kick in and support the officer. Domestic violence workers, people, you know, social workers. The defunding the police is allowing people who have um, uh, more expertise in certain areas to come alongside the police and support them. It's not just stripping the police of everything. Defunding, it sounds like a crazy word, but it's like, Defunding happens all the time. It happens in school districts. It happens in every um, mun- municipal uh, government, you know, city government. Defunding and reallocating funds happens all the time. Yeah, it's like rebalancing. Rebalancing, exactly. Cause, reallocating. Because nobody's talking about like taking that money away and throwing it in a dumpster fire. Like it's talking about rolling it into services that take away some of the things police have to do right now. Like mental health stuff, or uh, you know, like dealing with some of the some of the calls that police get that they like don't need to necessarily be the one answering that call, and like yeah. reallocating or, or putting social workers with the police to help them yes. deal with some of these things, and even giving a lot a lot more funding so that police can get the mental hair mental hair mental health support that they need, um, and 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 helping to weed out um, officers who are not truly representing. The badge, mm-hmm. helping you know to give support in how they hire hire police officers. I'm on a committee that helps to present diver- like to train officers in diversity. And I hear this, y'all. I'm a Black Lives Matter protester, and really, I'm just a person who's advocating for uh, Black lives. I'm not aligned with the Black Lives Matter organization. You know, white people can get caught up in so many semantics. I just care. I have three black sons, a black husband, black brother, all these, a black nephew, all these black people in my life, and I want to advocate for our existence. And so, I'm. I I protested at the Black Lives Matter uh, protesting um, at the rallies. But I also um, believe in supporting the police. I have great relationships with many officers in this community. I want to see them well. There are many amazing, wonderful police officers who deserve our report, support and respect. But we also need accountability and transparency. And that's all Black Lives Matter wants. We want um, account, accountability and transparency. And if you get rid of the bad apples... Which you can. There are systems in place right now that protect the bad apples. Yes. 
So police are like, and the Blue Lives Matter rally was talking about how oh, the police, like their reputation is like down in the dumps right now. But it's like at the same time, those same people are protecting the systems that keep the bad apples there. And those bad apples are the ones who are ruining the reputation for all the good the majority of uh, police officers are great and heroic. But if you have systems that protect the bad apples, then it pulls the whole system down. Exactly. And and so it's not loving to, to support those systems. And the meanwhile, because there are thousands, uh, I mean, you talked earlier, 14,000 or something police officers who are like overtly racist. Uh, like there are a bunch of overtly racist police officers who have basically unlimited backing and the ability under the current system to kind of be as racist as they want to be. You have disparities at every level of policing where yep. minorities are 30% more likely to be pulled over, three times more likely to have their vehicles searched, four times more likely to be charged with a crime, nine times more likely to be shot while unarmed. Uh, and then also prosecutors, uh, they tend to, uh, there's like this whole system white people are probably unaware of where prosecutors will load charges onto black people. Yep. So what will happen is, black person will just be doing one thing that you wouldn't even think is like such a big deal. But the prosecutor will find like nine different charges that fit that crime. Maybe they had like an ounce of uh, drugs and they were like driving with it. But then the officer will say like, well, you were doing uh, like transporting it, you were, had it, you were like, you, it, like find a bunch of different charges. And then the sentences for all those charges will add up to some like huge number and then they'll um, they'll do plea deals in order to keep it from backlogging the, the court system, and so what the, the effect of this is you'll end up with a lot of times innocent black people who yep. are facing thirty years in prison for for like all these astronomical charges and told like if you can if you just take the deal you'll get six months of prison and then probation, and well, they'll take the deal yeah. because of the fear of like all these charges they're loaded up with and because they're poor and can't afford a lawyer. Right. And then, and public defenders, that's a whole nother thing. Um, so then they'll take the deal and then they'll have a criminal record and they can't get a job. And then they can't like, or, or like if something else happens to them, then they're, they're, the value of their life is dismissed because, oh, he had this thing in his record. But a lot of times, I mean, the, the Serial podcast, their um, season three of Serial um, does a really good job at talking about this whole dynamic. Uh, that would be a good resource for that, it's season three of Serial. Um, how prosecutors will just use this system to have almost unlimited power over the lives of people, and there's no accountability. Yeah, There's no one overlooking or yeah. looking over their shoulders or seeing what they're doing and correcting it. And, and let's not even talk about Bell's Bonds, but there's a tension that you know a lot of black people exist in and that we respect um, the police officers, we want to be able to call police officers ourselves and it not go awry. Like, we want um, to be protected and served. Um, and many of the Black Lives Matter protesters, we're working in government. We're working in nonprofit organizations, community organization. We actually know the laws. We know, like, we're very well versed in what we're advocating for. We're working with, <clears throat> we're working with Public officials, we're working with police officers. As we're dealing with Darius Tarver, um, his situation, there's a tension that I exist in because I care about Darius's life, but I respect Chief Dixon and the city of Denton um, Police Department. I do want accountability. I believe Kevin Tarver. I believe um, that there were definitely some blind spots and some things that should not have happened with Darius's case. It is not cut and dry, but I can sit in the same room with Chief Dixon. I am not spitting in his face. I'm not calling him a pig. I res highly admire and respect, but that's the tension that black people, we exist in. We have to navigate life in a way that white people don't and white people just get to back the blue and, 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 and literally do what they want to do above the law mm -hmm. and not have to worry about, you know, fighting for their existence, they, but, but fighting for their privilege, but not for their existence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh couple things to just leave you guys with. Um, Brian Stevenson, civil rights lawyer, has this 
quote that's like gold. He says, our criminal justice system treats you better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. And I want to yeah. contrast that with Leviticus 19.15 in God's law. He says, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great or the rich, but judge your neighbor fairly. Amen. Garen, can you, can you end us with one of the guys that we interviewed, um, you know, and at first I maybe thought he was a little crazy, but the more I think about it, I bet a lot of white people think this. Um, and he, he was a self-admitted Christian and, um, I would love for you to like, let's just pretend that guy's listening to the podcast. Cause I think a lot of people will share this, but maybe not in the same words that he used or idea, but I, w- I want to charge people. I want to charge the Christians listening. So if you're not a Christian, then take it for what it's worth. Take it for what it's worth. But what something he said was, man, Hey man, look, it doesn't matter what we do down here. It just matters what, what we do when we go, when we get up there. And I think he was referring to like the idea of, Hey, look, it doesn't matter that much what all happens here on earth. It just matters what happens when we get to heaven. Can you, can you push back on that and then just charge? Like, let's just assume that guy's listening. What would you say to him to send our listeners off for this episode? Yeah. Jesus is not a get out of hell free card. Jesus is a king who in the Bible, it sets him up as a king who reigns over a kingdom. And in his kingdom, there's a certain way things work. And the way things work in the kingdom of Jesus is that the poor and the weak are elevated, that widows and orphans are protected. Pure and faultless religion is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and the rights of all who are destitute. That in Jesus's kingdom, the immigrants and the aliens, there, I could give you five pages of verses that I gathered from the Old Testament prophets about taking care of aliens and strangers, orphans and widows. Um, Maybe I think I'll send it to you. We can put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, that in Jesus's kingdom, there is justice and equality. And Jesus' kingdom is not a future reality in heaven where it's like, live however you want and then you'll go there. Jesus came to earth to establish his kingdom here. And he calls Christians to participate in this other way of living where our deepest citizenship is not in America. I'm not saying patriotism in all forms is bad, but oftentimes it can be idolatry. It can be like Christians elevating their, their patriotic status above their, their heavenly citizenship. But Jesus, in, in, for Christians, he calls us to a citizenship that is ultimately, um, our highest citizenship is heaven. And mm-hmm. we are supposed to live as citizens of heaven now on earth by living according to everything Jesus commanded and taught, which is to, to love. The, the Bible says, the whole law is summarized in the single command, love your neighbor as yourself. So the whole point of the law, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, there's a bunch of commands in the Bible. But all of those commands are just really specific examples of what it looks like to love. That God is love, and the whole law is summer. The greatest commandment is love God. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's all just kind of showing you what it looks like to love. And that's what Christians are supposed to obey. Is like a new command I give you, love as I have loved you, so you must love one another, it says in John. So we are called to right now be citizens of that heavenly kingdom where the currency is love, where we don't uh, celebrate criminals going to prison, but we celebrate prisoners going free. Jesus said, uh, like in Isaiah, one of the the prophecies about the coming of Jesus would be freedom of captivity for the prisoners. That's that's what we celebrate is the rehabilitation of people to be image bearers as they're supposed to be and to see their dignity. And we celebrate when, when poor people are given the ability to live with dignity and, uh, and, and grow into their full potential. Like that's what the kingdom of God is. That's what you're called to be a citizen of. And if you have some other version of Christianity that's just about like live with privilege now and go to heaven when you die, I don't think you actually read your Bible because that's very clearly not what the Bible says. But then it's also, uh, it's, it's a false gospel. It's like, like Jesus wants to be your king. And he calls you to live as a citizen of his kingdom. And if you just want him to be your genie, 
then you don't know the real Jesus. And can I just say real quick that loving, when, when, when Garen is talking about loving, loving means to see, know, understand, and care about someone from a deep place. It's not just being nice or, um, you know, it's not pleasantries. It's not um, just a passing emotion. It's not um, respectability politics. To know, to love someone, it's to really step into their space and um, see them, know them, understand, and let your your heart, your like your caring for them, um, let it flow and run deep. As opposed to, I'm just going to be nice. And that's love. That's not love. Mm-hmm. It's not love. Mourn with those who mourn. Like, yeah. empathize. Like, yeah. that's a command. Like, when the black community is mourning because they see another person who looks like their son's shot in the back. If your response is not to mourn with those who mourn, then you're not being faithful to the commands of Scripture. Like, it, 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 we are not just... It's not a recommendation that we love. Like that is a command. It's what we have to do. Thanks for listening to part one of this episode. Make sure to look in your feed and take a listen to part two. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast and be able to vote for future topics and listen to full interviews, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com backslash black history for white people. We'll leave you with this quote from Ijoma Aluo, the author of the book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Our police force was not created to serve black Americans. It was created to police black Americans and serve white Americans.